everybody. How are you? Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Commissioner, yeah, you made thanks it. Thanks for Your being boots here. boots made it, which are My awesome. boots made it, yeah. I love, I'm, I'm a rocking. huge fan of the, of the fur boots up I, here. I had a little walk this morning, so <laughs> you'll have to, I'll apologize for my footwear as well. well I, I I'm like, not regretting the choice at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's excellent. Well, thanks guys for having me. As, as mentioned, I'm Tony Rahm, the senior tech reporter at Politico. This is Commissioner McSweeney. And we're here to discuss everything in tech policy in 20 minutes, which it should be. No so, problem. Yeah, no problem at all. And we will take audience questions, so please um, have them ready. But I just want to start right off the gate with the comments that we just heard from the Justice Department about the need for uh, law enforcement to have greater access to encrypted communications. You've talked about this in the past. Give your reaction to this and generally where you think this debate should go. So I'll start with the usual caveat, which is that I'm a Federal Trade Commissioner, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of my colleagues or the Federal Trade Commission this morning. That's why I'm going to get to say provocative things on topics like encryption. We're cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I would say absolutely we need to make sure that law enforcement has the right tools to undertake their important mission and to protect us from the bad guys. But as a person charged with thinking about consumer protection, I deeply worry about things like mandatory backdoors and exceptional access systems and consumer facing products because I think it has the consequence of potentially making consumer data less secure. And we've been having this debate for a long time in this country. We've had it in the crypto wars, for example. Um, this is another round of this conversation. But one of the things that's changing is the amount of technology that we are connecting to in our personal lives and the amount of technology and communications and data that we're putting on those devices. So I think as we think about this wonderful wave of innovation and the internet of things that's sort of breaking over all of us as we wear wearables and connect our cars and connect our homes and connect everything onto smartphones, we need to be very mindful of consumer data security. And we should be very, very careful on anything that undermines that data security. I think it's especially true when you look at some of the new reports that are coming out suggesting that IoT adoption by consumers is a bit slow, perhaps because of security and privacy concerns. So the back door isn't the answer here. It sure sounds like is what you're saying. I'm saying I'm not burdened by having to look at intel information on a daily basis and looking at all the threats that are posed uh, to, to us uh, as we go about our daily lives. So I appreciate that there is a deep national security angle here. But from a consumer protection point of view, just thinking about the consumer data security, I think we would have to be, um, we have to be very, very careful in undermining that security. And all of the technologists will tell you that there isn't really a way to create mandatory backdoors and exceptional access systems without creating corresponding vulnerabilities. And that makes me really concerned. So where do we go from here? I hate to ask you to solve the entire <laughs> encryption debate in like just a few minutes, but what does the next step look like? Is it yeah. more conversation or do we need to somehow, you know, have the rubber meet the road, so to speak, on, on this encryption debate? Well, I think it's probably ongoing conversation. Again, I, I think we, from my perspective, I'd be very cautious. I'm personally opposed to government mandating this kind of thing. So that leaves you with conversation and dialogue and trying to form a solution. Sure, so let's flip to the other major issue in privacy right now, which is the US EU safe harbor. We're only a couple days away from the deadline imposed by Europe's top privacy regulators, by which they're gonna start taking a look at the arrangements between you know, US companies dealing with Europeans' data. Give us the state of play, so to speak, with the US EU safe harbor. Well, the Commerce Department is our lead negotiator, so I defer to them. Um, the FTC has been playing a supportive role. We are very hopeful that we can try to reach a resolution. We're trying to help our colleagues at the Commerce Department answer any remaining outstanding questions uh, from the Commission. And we take very seriously our potential role here in trying to enforce whatever comes next. Um, I think we're very capable of doing it. The FTC has brought over uh, 39 cases enforcing the old safe harbor. And so we will continue uh, to try to work through um, this negotiation and, and bring it to resolution. Sure, you know, you mentioned enforcement. That's one of the things that we keep hearing from European regulators, that they don't feel the, that the enforcement mechanism at the FTC is enough, and that it appears that they're seeking something much stronger from the US government. 
How do you view those criticisms and what do you think should happen with respect to FTC enforcement of the safe harbor? Well, I think we take very seriously um, the comments and criticisms and the process that the European Commission is engaging in to make sure that they have a framework that is workable going forward. Uh, I'm very confident in the FTC's process and its ability to, to be a quality consumer protection enforcer um, going forward. So I, I think that we have a demonstrated track record here and we will continue to work hard on this. Is it, is it then just a misunderstanding? Is it that you know Europe doesn't maybe understand the privacy mechanism here? Is it a fundamental difference in approach? What's at the heart of this uh, debate over the power of the FTC and privacy? Um, you know, I, I think that is an incredibly complex question. Uh, there are let, I, and, and I think there's some elements of all of those things in, in, in what we see happening in, the, in playing out right now. Um, are there misunderstandings about the extent to which we have privacy enforcement and protection in the United States? Uh, possibly, yes. And, I, and my colleagues and I do spend quite a lot of time explaining our sector-based approach and our consumer protection laws, both at the state level and uh, at the federal level, and how we work to protect uh, consumer privacy here in the United States. Uh, but also, um, there there is a legitimate set of legal differences. Uh, there is now a European Court of Justice opinion. Um, and so there, there are, I think, uh, reasonable, legitimate reasons why we have to um, continue to make sure that as the European Commission is um, a, a looking at what it needs in order to create a framework that we are answering those questions. And I, and I think we have been, so. Sure, at the heart of this is the debate you know, center around this this idea that we don't have an overarching comprehensive privacy law. Would that have made a difference in some of the battles between the US and the EU over the future of the safe harbor? I, I don't. I think that might be a simplification of, of what this is about, uh, because I think there is an acknowledgement that we have privacy protections here in the United States too, and that there are differences. Um, so I, I think it's um, certainly been the case that uh, we've had a very fulsome conversation over the last few years about comprehensive privacy legislation. My colleagues and I have supported comprehensive privacy legislation. I think it would be helpful probably in this kind of situation. But at the same time, we've taken very seriously our mission to protect consumer privacy with the tools that we have. And we've brought more than 100 data security and privacy cases. Um, we have, we and our colleagues at the, at the state level as well, I think have been working hard uh, to make sure that there are adequate privacy protections. Um, can we use additional tools? Would we like civil penalties? Would we like comprehensive legislation? Sure, uh, but we're going to keep working with the authorities that we have. Sure, so if you look into your crystal ball, February 1st being the deadline, you know, likelihood of us getting at least an agreement in principle on the safe harbor might be? Well, I am an optimistic person, uh, so I will remain hopeful. Um, you know, I think that's really in the hands of the lead folks at the Commerce Department um, and at the Commission, and so we'll wait and see. I know they're working really hard. Sure, if we can zoom out even past privacy and just look at the US-European relationship here, I, I, I hear a lot from companies and from folks that, that, that just see you know, both continents going in different directions. Um, especially when you factor in that Europe is taking a look at companies like Google on the antitrust side of things. Do you see that divergence and what effect is it having? I, uh, well, on the antitrust side particularly, but also on the consumer protection side, I see far more areas where we are converging than diverging. And will there be some differences over time? Uh, certainly in both, in both sides, uh, um, I think, on the consumer protection and antitrust side. That's very natural. Um, in fact, if you look at the uh, 60,000 foot view over the last 30 years, I think you see far more convergence than divergence. I am um, very hopeful about that because I think um, the European Commission, which has prioritized a digital single market, is looking very seriously at how to spur domestic innovation, uh, really recognizes that cross-border data flows and having workable mechanisms for us to all work together to protect consumers both in Europe and the United States are essential. Sure, the commission made its decision on the landmark Google investigation before you arrived at the FTC. Sure. But just given this conversation about Europe and the fact that this is still ongoing over in Brussels, what are your thoughts about that probe and what any role the FTC might play there? 
Well, it's, it's uh, an ongoing case in Europe, and as you know, it was decided here at the FTC before, before I joined, so I don't have the benefits of the full record um, and, and haven't looked at them. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to know, although I would say it would be an extremely unusual circumstance where um, the FTC, having taken a decision on a set of facts, would um, reopen them. That doesn't mean we can't look at new things uh, and facts as they present themselves. Are you guys looking at new things? Any, anything? Well, you said, you I wouldn't you, comment. <laughs> you said you even if we were. Statements. You said you make provocative statements. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> I've got a bunch more questions, but let me turn it over to the audience to see if you guys have any thoughts. Anybody? I mean, I can talk for days. Everybody, <laughs> as you all know, <laughs> these two over here. Uh, Mike Nelson with Cloudflare, and I also teach at Georgetown. Uh, I was interested in your comments about how the U.S. <clears throat> and the EU are or are not diverging. I'm much more concerned about how individual agencies within European governments are diverging. We can't seem to get a straight answer as to what European policy is in many of these countries because the regulator for privacy is saying more privacy while law enforcement and intelligence is passing new laws, more surveillance, and, and actually taking away some of the fundamental privacy uh, protections that have been there for years. This is particularly true in France. Do you have any insights on whether the Europeans are going to be able to speak with one voice within an individual country? Well, I, I think you've really uh, pointed out some of the complexities of of this problem and why it is such a uh, politically and um, legally complex situation in Europe right now. Um, I, I don't envy my European colleagues as they try to um, manage it to a solution. I think it's incredibly complicated and uh, not at all an expert on, on really the, the complexities of that, that three-dimensional uh, problem. But, um, I think we have to continue to keep working towards resolutions, and I think when you um, think about wanting to get innovation and spur innovation um, and bring new technologies to market and have consumers be able to take advantage of them, you have to answer some of these questions along the way. Sure, there's another question right over there. Hi, uh, Evan Schwarzschaber with Tech Freedom. Uh, if the ECJ struck down Safe Harbor because of American surveillance practices and our unwillingness to reform them, and the FTC's purview is consumer privacy, which is an important issue, but I would argue separate, how is the FTC going to get a sustainable safe harbor that doesn't get struck down again if the agency can't reform ECPA, can't reform Section 702, can't pass the Judicial Redress Act and really address Schrems' concerns. I, I don't understand how this new agreement is going to pass muster if we don't fix all those other things. So that's why I am uh, really noting the fact that the Commerce Department is the lead negotiator here because as you point out, there is commercial privacy and then there are the national security issues as well and they're all a factor in this discussion. The FTC does not participate in the national security uh, side of this discussion. We focus on our commercial consumer privacy enforcement and our equities there. Uh, so we can be helpful on that side of the debate. I think we are helpful and I think we are really working hard to make sure that we are using all of our authorities and doing everything that we have committed to do. But we can't address those broader issues, you're right. Does, does the issue, I mean, again, knowing that the Commerce Department leads this, but does Judicial Redress Act, is that the thing on which all of this hinges? I know for some of the other law enforcement agreements between the US and Europe, you know, passage of redress, which is still making its way through Congress, has been the number one thing. How important is that even to the safe harbor conversation that's happening now? Well, again, I'm not on the front lines of the day-to-day -day conversation, so I don't want to characterize how important it is or is not. But it, in my personal perspective, I think it would certainly be valuable. Any other audience questions? Alex? Sure. Uh, just speak up, I guess. We got a live stream. We got it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wait for the mic cool. so the, the Snowden folks can... Uh, <laughs> sure. uh, so, uh, Alex Howard, uh, independent writer these days. Uh, Ars Technica had a story that just shot all around my stream this past weekend about a search engine that showed up baby monitor feeds. Yeah, I saw that. You know, I specifically got one that had a radio frequency, which is a little harder to hack maybe yeah. than the one of the IP address. Are you all looking at the Internet of Things from a consumer protection standpoint? And if so, what specific measures or enforcement actions do you anticipate taking in 2016? 
Uh, yes, we are. Um, so not only did the FTC issue its Internet of Things report um, about a year ago, which we, in which we noted vast range of security practices in this industry, some of which are deeply troubling. Um, I personally have spent a lot of time both uh, at hacker conferences looking at IoT security and also just thinking about this issue. Um, I'm also a parent, so I really get this connected thing in terms of baby monitors and toys and all of that. Um, and, and, and I am deeply worried about some of the security practices. One of the things that I think is um, interesting here is you're starting to see some research indicating that uh, it's not just federal trade commissioners who are worried about these things, that actually consumers are worried about them as well. Um, and I think that we uh, do take seriously research around uh, connected products when there are security vulnerabilities and are developing our in-house capabilities of recreating that research and applying it to our enforcement mission as well. So I expect you will see more to come from the FTC on Internet of Things security. Sure. The other, the other if I have anything to say about it. Sure. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was the IoT report that was just mentioned. There was also the big data report That's right. that came out in time for the Consumer Electronics Show. We write a show. lot of reports. A lot of reports. We read a lot of the reports. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you guys write a lot. Talk a little bit about the report, but also where we go from here. I was, I was struck that the report didn't say that the FTC was you know, launching a new policymaking effort. It wasn't bringing enforcement cases. So talk about the report and where we actually go from here with it. So this report, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, was actually called, I think, like big data tool for inclusion or exclusion. And one of the things that we were looking at in this report is the extent to which there are existing consumer protection, civil rights, equal opportunity laws that protect consumers from some of the harms that we might be worried about, like um, opportunities being denied or credit being denied or employment being denied, housing, that kind of thing. Um, and the extent to which some of the some of those existing laws may have some gaps in them, such as um, if you're using your own data and not buying it uh, from another uh, third party, then um, the scope of coverage under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, for example, might be different. And so those are some of the gaps identified in the report. But we're also teeing up the broader conversation, and this is one that I think folks are having throughout the, this administration in a really thoughtful way, and throughout the private sector, which is if you're using big data and big data analytics, as everybody is now starting to do, um, what are your in-house responsibilities and ethics around those practices? Are you thinking about questions about the quality of your data set? Are you thinking about um, ways in which your algorithms operating on the data and maybe recreating biases? If you detect that kind of thing, what is the reaction to it and what is the appropriate response? You know, just uh, last week we actually had PrivacyCon, maybe it was two weeks ago, anyway, PrivacyCon at the FTC, um, in which we uh, were really looking at, spend a day sort of looking at a bunch of new research that's being done in uh, universities around the world, really, um, and, and in the private sector and, and among researchers. Um, and some of it really indicates that there are some situations where um, there are uh, disparities or sort of disparate impact arising. So for example, women not seeing uh, career counseling advertisements being, being an example potentially there. Um, but there was also a lot um, that was being done and, and a lot of research that I find incredibly helpful in this area around testing the impact of algorithms, tools, to protect consumer privacy, um, and ways that we can really start to think about uh, what um, data ethics by design really looks like. Sure. Uh, switching gears entirely to the issue of patents, um, the FTC is taking a look um, at patent assertion entities, which some folks call patent trolls, um, with its big 6B study. What's the status of that report? And you know, thinking more broadly about patent reform, has just given the state of litigation, all the lawsuits and so forth, you know. Are we at the point now where the conversation about patent reform is too far behind where we are in the legal system? Um, well, let me take the first, sure. first one, which is a bit easier. Um, the FTC has its authority um, to actually use process to conduct investigations of different uh, sectors if we so choose. So one of the ways we're using that authority, the 6B authority, is to study patent assertion entities. Uh, I don't call them trolls because I think that's a little pejorative, but um, that is a that is a name that has been used uh, in this discussion. Um, and, and so we are in the process of hopefully um, 
moving through uh, getting that report out. I have my fingers crossed that we'll be able to get it done um, soon enough to have, have it play a role in the legislative conversation. As you point out, uh, this is not a static environment. The courts have been thinking through some of the issues here uh, while there has been a legislative conversation, while we have been undertaking a study as well of a, of a very opaque sector. Um, so I actually think all of those pieces really fit together and ought to inform the legislative conversation, and I think they will. That's that's one of the beauties of our process. I sure, but has, can has, accommodate that. has, you know, just given the developments of litigation, the mm -hmm. speed at which that's moved relative to Congress, which has been talking about some of the same issues in patent reform for a couple of years, I just wonder if there's now a disconnect between you know, what's actually needed and what's being proposed on Capitol Hill. Do you feel that way? Um, well, I'm still waiting to see uh, exactly what we find in our study, and I'd be better positioned to tell you where I think those disconnects are when I see the results of it, um, to the extent that there are any. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure I would say there's a disconnect as much as um, there are certainly some um, changes that ought to be thought about by legislators who are thinking about changing the law. Sure. Anything in particular you'd highlight that maybe isn't getting due consideration in some of the reform debate on the Hill? Um, well, one of the things that we think about at the FTC, of course, are deceptive demand letters. And we have been using our Consumer Protection Authority where we've found deceptive <laughs> demand letters to bring actions. Um, you know, I remain very open to using our authority that way, but the fact is, is we haven't seen a lot of those coming uh, to us. Um, so, uh, you know, one question I have right now is the extent to which that is is a problem. And if it is and you're experiencing it, I will put in a plug for coming to talk to us at the FTC about it. Sure. Just one last thing as we, as we begin to wrap up here. Uh, when I spoke with FTC Chairwoman Ramirez at the end of last year, she and I talked a little bit about Volkswagen and some of the clean energy issues that the company has faced uh, in recent months, now the lawsuit from the Justice Department and so forth. Um, and it all comes down in part to the software bug um, that, that, that had allowed them to circumvent these emission standards. Thinking about that and looking at the FTC, the powers it has and the resources it has, I just wonder in all these conversations if it would be beneficial for the agency or the government writ large to have more folks who can do the sort of coding work, who can analyze software to figure out anything from the biases and big data to some of the flaws that we saw with, uh, with Volkswagen. I'd love your thoughts on, on the resources you have and whether you think you need more of them to do that consumer protection work. So setting aside Volkswagen, since <laughs> that's a t difficult, loaded, contemporary topic for us, um, yeah, I would, I would say the answer to that question is absolutely we need more. Uh, but one of the things I'm really happy and excited about is the way in which we have been expanding our in-house technology capabilities at the FTC. We have created the Office of Technology Research and Investigation, OTRI, which uh, is not only helping support our investigations, but also providing a way for us to bring technologists into our enforcement mission. And I find the technical expertise critically important um, to our mission. I suspect there are other agencies that would be uh, would find it similarly helpful. So I can't speak for them, but I imagine getting more resources, uh, having more people who understand technology working on those issues in government and on the Hill and in public policy discussions. It's going to be incredibly important. Great. Do we have time for audience questions or are, are we? I think, let's take uh, one, one more if anyone has one. <laughs> we'll have to keep it brief so I don't get yelled at. <laughs> Uh, Alex Howard again. Thanks, Tony. Uh, this is straightforward. Uh, can't comment on VW specifically, but does the FTC view it as consumer friendly to make our devices, our vehicles, our homes more open to us as consumers and citizens? Which is to say, should we be able to look at the source code behind the things we own to make sure there aren't back doors or there aren't pieces of software which might be preventing an accurate emissions test? Should we have a right to examine that code? Is that more consumer friendly? So I'm going to take this one as an individual, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues or the FTC, but I think transparency and having the ability to uh, take a look at some of these things is going to be really important. Now, I'm mean, amazed that um, for the people that actually have the capacity to do that. That's certainly not what I'm going to be doing right in my free time. Um, but I really view um, 
I think this gets into something that I have spent a little bit of time thinking about, which is the very vital role of white hat security researchers in this environment. And so right now those are security researchers, but you could imagine that this, there's a bunch of white hat sort of work from people who have that kind of skill that might be very valuable to informing consumers going forward. Um, and I think there will be some tools. I'd like to see competition and innovation in this space, consumer facing tools, things that I can use both to um, say, uh, have my privacy settings be observed by the different things I'm connecting up to, or uh, help me as I'm walking around in an interconnected world know when things aren't um, you know, as I would wish them to be, right? I don't have the technical ability to do that, but I really hope that the innovations will come into the market that I'll be able to use um, to, to help me uh, as an individual consumer. So, so yes, I, I think uh, it can be very, very important. I think we need to continue to have technologists and people who have and consumer protection people in these policy conversations really explaining the value of transparency um, in, in this environment. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for having me, Commissioner. Thanks thank so much you, for being here. And now back to Tim or whomever is taking the microphone. For me. <laughs>